offensive. But see, when you shout, <coughs> the one nearly blows my eardrums off. Because, see, where the the part, the carry on the new way, car flaps. My car's taking the fence. And uh, so I've got to put his phones on. And uh, so the car doesn't hear you. <laughs> because now the car's going on at me to get a car flap. Because we've not got one. And uh, I just wanted to know if you'd stop shouting a wee bit, if possible. Well, the answer to that is providing people cease to provide the stimuli, I will be happy not to shout. But just occasionally, one loses one's tether with the imbeciles that join us. Oh, okay, I can have a... I don't know, it's just me... It was all right until the... the have, have you run 30 miles just before this call? You seem gasping <laughs> for breath. <laughs> I, I'm actually... I'm, I'm, I'm a work like knowing I've had to run me all the news with one and do something like... I see. Check them. Do the security they, like that. Ah. So, uh, I think you'd better have a lie down. <laughs> Get a sack for doing that. Well, you may well get a sack, but if you don't go and relax somewhere, I think there's a fair chance of you expiring, Trevor. <laughs> it's very good publicity. If you do die in the next few moments, you will at least have my gratitude, because, of course, that would make excellent publicity for the programme. <laughs> <I could, could. laughs> All right, Trevor. You, do, you go away and have a lie down, kid. I will. <laughs> Cheers, you know. Speaking of people having cardiac arrest, which is not a funny subject at all, I was approached this evening by a commander in the St John Ambulance, inviting me to take part in a campaign they've got coming up quite soon teaching people how to resuscitate somebody is the easiest way. You know, the old mouth-to-mouth -mouth and heart massage. And sometime in the not-too-distant future, there's going to be a big publicity splurge, which I hope to be involved with. However, how do Carl? Ooh, what a lovely sound. Hello, Jim. Ah, Jim. Hello? Hello. Um, I'd like to talk about hanging. Yeah. Well, what do you think they should do? That's a question. You said you want to talk about it. Well, Would you like to tell us what you've got to say? Yeah. Well, I think they should hang him. What do you think? They should hang who? Murderers. Why? Why? Because mm. they've murdered others, aren't they? And if you keep them in jail for life, they'll get freed in ten years and they'll just kill again. So if you hang him, well, you get rid of them, won't you? It rather depends. I mean, first of all, the answer to you'll get rid of them, won't you, if they hang them, is yes. OK? Yeah. What happens in the situation where a person is convicted Who's of murder... Innocent. ...and innocent, yes. Yeah. Well, if they're in jail for life, say you've got ten murderers, they're put in jail for ten years yes. for life, they get let out, each of those murderers commits another murder, that means ten innocent people are Well, first of all, killed. Jim, first of all, Jim, the mathematics... Oh, my, my name's Carl. Oh, you're Carl, are yeah. you? Jim must be online too. Never mind, we've mm. finally found you, Carl. Yeah. Pleasure to know you. If your statistics were correct, then it would be easier for me to agree with you. However, your statistics are not correct. The vast majority of people convicted of murder do not commit murder again. In fact, it is very, very unusual. The vast majority of murders or killings of other people are committed in an instantaneous rage rather than some pre-planned incident. Hi. Um, you've always got the radio on. Well, what's it's that got to do with me? Ah, aren't you going to tell her to turn it off? I can't hear it. I'm only interested in when I can hear it. All right. That's all right. Um, well, all right, you're going to crossings on Saturday, aren't you? That's got nothing to do with public hanging or even private hanging. All I'm right. not going to be hung. Let's talk about hanging, then. Well, Carl, I think you've expired the subject as best you can, or expounded the subject as best you can, otherwise you wouldn't have been in such a hurry to change the subject. Have another think and ring me back. Hello, Jim. Hello, Ron. Sorry we misled you by calling Carl Jim, but That's go right, on. Okay. okay. I'd like to talk about Band-Aid, please. Go on. Whereas I think it's necessary that we alleviate the human suffering in Africa, I think that if we feed so many people these few years with the Band-Aid Trust and so on and so forth, 
something in a few years' time after that, we're going to have to feed even more because of the massive population growth in those areas. That is possible, and I cannot deny that. However, the situation in Ethiopia is unusual in that they have had four years of failed crops due to drought. Yep. Now, that was unprecedented. They've never had that problem before. Ethiopia, in the past, has actually been an agricultural exporter. Yep. So, there is always the possibility, indeed, some would say the probability, that this is a temporary situation. Yep. Although it will face us again at some time in the future, it's a bit like a, an earthquake. It happens, you deal with it, and it doesn't happen again for a long time. Yeah. So, that's the first argument against your theory. Yeah. The next argument against it is that Live Aid, not just Band-Aid, yeah. it, it's bigger than that now, but Live Aid aren't just feeding the hungry mouths of today. They are involved in other processes, the process of education, the process of buying farm implements and buying seed. So they're not just, if you like, giving a man a fish, they're also teaching the man to fish. Yeah, but now that we have fed him, you know, primarily, don't you think it would be a good idea to sort of run a, con run a contraceptive education program, you know, teaching them about contraceptives? So I think it would be an excellent idea, providing it was done properly and not done just as a compulsory thing. Kind of thing. It needs to be done, absolutely. I think the whole world needs more information about contraception. The great problem with contraception is that the Western world, and the Western opinion, is that contraception is a matter of a woman taking a pill. Yeah. Now that sounds like a very simple solution, or at least it did in the 60s. We're now discovering that the pill has horrendous, horrendous side effects. We're only just now dealing with that in the Western world. I think it would be inhuman and immoral to foist that upon Ethiopia. I suppose, again, it could be against their religion. I mean, I don't know what religion they are, but... Well, there are a variety of religions, and <laughs> yes, it could be. But yeah. that is no reason, no reason at all, for not immediately starting a process of education about contraception. Absolutely vital throughout the world, but not compulsory. Not yeah, make it compulsory. It's just that at the moment, the, gro the population growth rate isn't going down, but like, you know, the number of people surviving infancy and so on and so forth is, you know, and the um, average life expectancy is con increasing as well. Indeed, but it, it ill begets a nation such as ours who now have the birth rate under control, or at least not under control in the sense of somebody, one individual controlling it, but reducing, it ill begets us that eat meat and live a life of comparative luxury to tell those in poverty how to live their lives. Perhaps a little less greed on the part of the Western world would alleviate the need for the birth control. I do accept the immediate need for it, but you were talking about feeding them being not a good answer because it's short term. We need to feed them and educate them. Well, allow me to say that we need to feed them and educate them about contraception, but we also need to educate the whole world about how to stop such things happening. We have a situation in Europe where we have a beef mountain, a butter mountain and a grain mountain. And just across the Mediterranean Sea, people are starving to death. Mm. So we don't need contraception. What we need is less disgusting policies in the world, not just in the EEC, throughout the world. So our immediate imperative is to feed them then? Obviously. Do, obviously, to alleviate the famine. And then you think we should continue with the programme of contraception and so forth? I think we should implement and maintain a program of education about contraception, but I think it is just as vital for the Western world to look to its laurels and consider what it can do. Remember, the wealth we've got in the Western world yeah. comes from 
Africa and other such places. We've only got rich by stealing off other yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the sort of GNP of a place like Ethiopia, it's about $80 a head, and we've got about, you know, $3,000 a head. Indeed. It's quite so ridiculous. Um, would you agree to a sort of policy that got rid of the food mountains and wine lakes and so on and so forth and sent them off to Africa? I don't think the Ethiopians would welcome wine all that no, much. No, that's true, but... I would approve of a change in the policy that creates those surpluses, certainly, but seeing as how we've got the surpluses at the moment, if those surpluses are of, in food that would be useful in Ethiopia and other places of starvation, then yes, let us send them there, mm -hmm. let us pay the cost of sending them there, let us not worry about it too much. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks Say hi to Bacon and Egg. Certainly not. How do Steve? All right, Sam. Uh, I want to talk about Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what you were saying the other week when there's, there's no jobs, four million unemployed, when somebody was going on about how much do you like that and all that? Well, uh, the four million aren't created by her, are they? Who are they created by? Well, I mean, it's just, when she come into power, there was already two and a half million unemployed. When yes, we in power. but she did come into power promising the nation, you may remember the adverts, promising the nation that she was going to cut the dole queues. She seems not to have done that. Yeah, but, uh, but, but she never has seen, I mean, the Labour would have had the same problems if they would have stayed in power. When, if Labour that is in... perfectly possible, but we only have one set of figures, we only have one lot of evidence. Yeah, and the evidence well. is that the promise by the Tory party to cut unemployment yeah. has proven to be an empty promise. And normally one blames the government, but on the basis of incidents today, I think we're quite right to say it's not the government's fault, it's Thatcher's fault. Yeah, but, uh, so if Labour would have come in, they probably wouldn't have done much better anyway, because uh, unemployment's gone up through more school leavers coming onto the door and things like that. Or uh, factories going bankrupt, which she didn't foresee when she, before she came into power. Do you not think, Steve, that she has an obligation to foresee? A nation, a government, has a tremendous control on the ability of an industry to survive. Yeah. We see already Westland Helicopters is struggling, indeed facing bankruptcy. Yeah. And yet, our armed forces, our own armed forces, say they haven't enough helicopters. Now, that, that company need not be facing a takeover. In all honesty, we, we've all been blinded by the fact that Westland is going to be taken over by, either by a European consortium or an American consortium. Yeah. Quite honestly, neither of that was necessary. If this government had have purchased the helicopters that the armed forces want. Now, I don't want them to purchase them, but yeah. the reality is, had they done so, Westland would still be in existence as a company in its own right, facing a glorious future. But oh. no. So, uh, Britain bought helicopters from foreign countries, then, yeah? No, they just didn't buy the ones that are required. They didn't buy enough. Yeah. We well, have in this country... They buy Sea King, don't they? That's made by Westland. They do buy helicopters from Westland. Indeed, the British government, I think, is a 60%... 60% all Westland business goes yeah. to British... Com goes to the British forces or the British government. So they're the largest customer by far. But that doesn't alter the fact that the government has bought less product than they might otherwise have done so. They could have bought more. The armed forces clearly need more. For heaven's sake, there are only about five police forces in Britain that yeah. have got helicopters. It's these days a necessary tool for a police force. Every police force in Britain, certainly in Lancashire we need one, mm. but we haven't got one. And there's a helicopter company, a major employer in Britain, going to the wall. Why? Because the government has decided not to supply the brass. Fine, that's the government's right. But you can't then, or the government can't then, devolve itself of all responsibility of unemployment. It came into power on a promise of reducing unemployment. Whether that was uh, able, whether they were, whether it was possible for them to reduce unemployment is actually irrelevant. They believed it possible, they promised it was possible, and they've doubled unemployment. Yeah, but uh, it 
it costs a lot of money, doesn't it? I mean, the standard of living wouldn't be this high because, like, for example, Westland, if it was Labour, they'd probably say, yeah, yeah, I will Steve, step in and buy it or give them the loan. You say the need. standard of living wouldn't be this high. Well, OK, I, I don't know about you, but I have a very high standard of living. But that's there, are four million people, there are four million people in this country who have got an abysmal standing of standard of living. Yeah. Absolutely abysmal. So to say the standard of living wouldn't be so very high, all that's happened, all that really does happen when unemployment grows, is that the standard of living for those left in employment moves far away from those out of employment. Yeah. It's rather like the average between ten and one is something like five and a half. The average between twelve and one is six. So the average doesn't alter very much, but the difference for the guy that was on 10 and he's now on 12 is quite a, quite a big one. Yeah, but, uh, oh yeah, I mean, the unemployed, yeah, it's probably worse under the Conservative government than what it is under the Labour government, you know, uh, for the unemployed people, because I think Labour do a little bit more for them than what uh, the Conservatives do. But, well, that, that remains the, to be seen, doesn't it? The workers it? Are not, uh, 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 should be better off now with uh, the inflation being low, low, running at its lowest for the both uh, well, when you say the workers, Steve, do you mean those people who are in gainful employment? Yeah. Or do you mean the population? Because surely, surely, we don't want a government that creates echelons in our society and, and reaffirms those echelons. We don't want a government that says, OK, we can't give everyone a decent living, so what we'll do is give the good stuff to them over there and we'll do it by creating a bigger group of those with nothing. Because that's all that's happened, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, them that haven't got much, haven't got much more since Conservatives come in anyway, but uh, the ones who were, are on good wages are getting taxed uh, less than what they would be with the Labour government. Well, again. But you were saying yourself, I mean, but that does create jobs for somebody else, because if, uh, last, uh, a few weeks ago you were saying yourself, it may, it's not worth your time to do some, because the amount of tax you pay, it's hardly worth going out to do your appearances or whatever you do. But uh, that's making an opening for somebody else, another fairly well-known person in that area, to go out and do that night, you know what I mean? So it yes, indeed, but we're talking, we're talking about a very, very minuscule part of the, if you like, the, the commerce of this nation, when you talk about the entertainment industry. Yeah. And oh, well, that, no, yeah. that is just a personal decision of mine, that my standard of living is now actually quite nice. I don't need to go out and do all that work. Yeah, but it's I not, don't... It's I not don't worth it. It doesn't improve my standard yeah. of living I, at all. I, I, I wasn't... I was just giving that as an example, mm. just that you're in the entertainment business. I didn't mean just the entertainment business. In any uh, well-paid people's jobs, you know, like company directors or whatever, yes. they're getting... The more the end, the higher percentage the tax should be than the man who earns 120. If they get taxed 10%, the man who earns 1,100 should get taxed about 20 or 25% of that money. Because he well, doesn't need all that. That's the way the uh, government looks at it, Labour government, anyway, when they're perhaps in. Perhaps what we need to look at is whether income tax should be on an ascending scale. Should it be? Should a rich person pay a massive rate of income tax on the bit that he gets above a certain limit? Or should everybody pay at least the same rate of income tax all the way through? Yeah, but uh, it's it's not really fair anyway, is it? If somebody makes a uh, hundred pound and pays ten, well, it's more than ten out of a hundred anyway, isn't it? It's about twenty-five, but pays twenty-five out of that and ends up with seventy-five. Someone makes a thousand and pays, what, two hundred and fifty, ends up with seven hundred and fifty. They should say to him, well, five hundred will do you, you know, you're making a thousand, whether it's through his brain or what, you know. It doesn't go by that, it goes by he's getting more, more than enough than what the normal fellow's getting anyway. Yes, by still and... Fifty percent. That sounds like a very good idea, and it sounds like a redistribution of wealth, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean a redistribution of the wealth, because the person paying both of them is probably one of the 7.6% of the nation that own 80% of the wealth of this country. People like the Duke of Westminster, who is a multimillionaire. There's a guy just gone to prison, the Duke of Blanford, and he's going to inherit a fifty million pound fortune. Yeah. That is disgraceful. Disgraceful. That guy will be a millionaire 
50 times over. Is he worth it? Yeah, no. but I mean, people only get the millions quicker by not getting taxed higher. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, <laughs> once they've got that money, you can't take it back off them. But the thing is, you should take uh, a good amount in tax anyway. Well, I dispute that you can't take it back off them. They do manage to take a considerable amount of money off the ordinary working class guy. So why can't we take a considerable amount of money off the filthy rich? Yeah. It is actually criminal that there are people in this world that can afford to buy whatever they feel like buying. I mean, Bristow today, the helicopter guy, yeah. bought literally millions of pounds worth of shares in a company. And that company's employees benefited not one dot. The people that make that company, the people yeah. that create that company, the people who work to provide that company with its existence, yeah, um, get not one yeah. bean out of that. Now, that stinks. Yeah. But, However, uh, we're a long way from unemployment, Steve. Yeah. OK? Well, yeah, uh, there was one thing I was going to say. That last election coming up there, Michael Foot, you know, when... I uh, don't know whether you heard him until he said, when I get in power, I'll cut the uh, three million down to one and a half within two years if I get in power. So straight away he got three million votes against him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm OK, Steve, thank you. Good night. Director Inquiries, which town, please? Preston, Drake's Health and Leisure Club. Drake's, that's 863858. Do you know, I've had lots of requests for that number. Wonder why? I guess everyone must have had the same idea as me. To join Drake's to get in trim for summer. Drake's? The exclusive health and leisure club. There's two large gymnasiums, a swimming pool, two jacuzzis, saunas, sunbeds. Sounds really good. It is, and Drake's seems to be such a sociable place. There's a bar and restaurant as well as things like volleyball, discos, barbecues. Now I know why everyone's calling Drake's. In fact, I'm going to give them a ring myself. <laughs> Drake's, the ultimate health and leisure club at Broughton Park, Garstang Road, Broughton. And remember, Drake's do it seven days a week, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Telephone 863-858. If you want a 1986 holiday at 1985 prices, you'd better be quick. Give me your holiday flying start with National Travel. National Travel World have holiday bargains at all of their branches. Now all back by their unique double shore guarantee. So if it's Spain, Portugal, Greece or just a holiday in this country, then pop into National Travel World today. You'll be amazed at the choice, but delighted with their prices. We're open certain Sundays in January, so check press for details. Give your holiday a flying start with National Travel World. It's sale time. You'll get no gimmicks and leftons, but you will get the biggest and best bargains in the area. Sale of hundreds of three-piece suites with savings of up to £500. A sale of great selection, high-quality, low-cost wall units, dining tables and chairs. Up to 40% off leading branded beds. We have over 500 in stock, all at rock-bottom prices. Oddmans to clear at crazy prices. See the same leftons, low, low prices at the massive walk-round showroom, General Street, Blackpool. The furnishing centre, Topping Street, Blackpool. And the bed centre, Church Street. Blackpool. Free delivery throughout the area. Price Busters by Blackpool Tower is closing down. Everything must go by Saturday, January the 11th. Price Busters reopens Good Friday, March the 28th. Meanwhile, everything reduced with rock bottom prices to clear stocks by next Saturday at Price Busters. Now to Jacqueline. Hello, Alan. Um, I just want to offer a word of comfort to all those um, who, like me, have been on the receiving end of several obscene phone calls. Um, now, this is what I found to be the, really the best remedy of all. They must think we're thick and we can't predict such things. Hello, Julie. Oh, Alan. I've got a problem. It's, it's my father's last name, surname. Am I allowed to say it? No. No? No. Oh. Well, I've got, well, could I just ask you about another problem? I've been sledging all day and we've got a chat bomb. Well, I suggest you hang yourself in the garden to dry. How do, Anne? Hello, Alan. Uh, earlier on in the programme, you were talking about double-decker bungalows, mate net being double-decker bungalows. Well, the thing is, I live in a mate net and they're a double-decker house. What? It's a double-decker house. A bungalow has only got one story. Yeah. Well, a masonette is like a house on top of a house. 
because I have like two stories. I've got me stairs and me upstairs and downstairs. I knew someone would correct me. My auntie Lillian only had one level. Oh, well, we, <laughs> these masonettes I live in have got two levels. It's like a house on top of a the house. There you go, you see. Okay. I know now. <laughs> thank you very much, Jan. OK, thank you. Bye. Masonette is a double-decker house, not a double-decker bungalow. Hello, Peter. Hello, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to talk about rugby. Go on. Yeah, well, there's not enough on television like you is the sport. What do you mean, there's not enough? Well, there's not enough televised like you have to with football. It's on virtually every week, which football recently hasn't been. Yeah, only because there's a big dispute over it. Well, indeed, but, <laughs> you know, football's on every week. Uh, rugby's on every week. How much more do you want? Well, I'd like to see a bit more on telly, you know, a bit more televised. Mm, what sort of rugby would you like to see televised? Uh, rugby league. Rugby league. Well, it's on every Saturday. Yeah, what yeah, more do you want? I'm a fan, you see, and can't get enough of it. I see. Well, we don't run television stations to satisfy keen fans of one particular thing. It is there for a cross-section of the population. However, you want more rugby league, I suggest you go to a game. How do Peter? Once upon a time, there was a non-conforming thrush who decided not to fly south for the winter. However, soon the weather turned so Excuse cold me. that we looked... I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't... Excuse, oi, 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 oi. I'm not nicking copyright, it's me, I don't care. I didn't know that thrushes flew south for the winter. Just listen, it's dead funny. And it isn't dead funny, it has to be accurate to be funny. I thought thrushes stayed here. Okay, uh, an eagle. An eagle? Yeah. Eagles do stay here. A budgie? And budgies don't fly anywhere. A sparrow? Oh no, oh, what Sparrows a stay here as well. I'm Good night. Fly. I'll do Phil. Hello, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, listen, I'm going to have to make a complaint. We'll make one. <laughs> Listen, I've only been listening to your show a week, and I'm absolutely hooked on it. And now I'm stuck here between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. I just can't go to bed now without because I'm frightened of missing something. Now, <laughs> now, now my missus... So basically, you're just a nosy bugger. <laughs> I know, but my missus is in hospital having a baby, and it's going to come on Saturday. Now, when she comes out, that's it. I'm going to have to go to bed when I'm told then, and I can't, I can't stay up all night. Well, let's face it, you will be up half the night anyway, Phil, so it won't make much difference. Yes, well, do you think you, <laughs> do you, think you could time your shows for the 9 o'clock feed, the 4 o'clock feed, the 4 o'clock feed? <laughs> hey, listen, I'll tell you what, it's very reassuring to know, you know, that all the Pratt, Pillocks and Burks are all tuned into your programme. Yes, they're not out doing half. Well, <laughs> yes, you know, since you've been on the air, there's not half as many telephone boxes wrecked. <laughs> well, some of them are wrecked trying to get through, but never mind. <laughs> nice to hear from you. What, what are you hoping to have? I Anything healthy, to be quite honest. Anything healthy? Yeah. I wish you and your wife luck. Thanks, Cheer Alan. Up. Cheers. Bye. I'll do Joe. Uh, good evening, Alan. Good evening. I'd like to talk about uh, your employment situation in Preston, which could be improved. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, there's the river buses and the corporation buses all running around without conductors. Couldn't the government sort of pump a bit of money into that section and then play at least 60 or 70 people? The answer to the question is, could the government do it, it is clearly yes, but the government has said without any any doubt at all that it is not prepared to subsidise the transport industry and it would have to be subsidised. Indeed the government is currently underway dismantling the transport industry as we know it and replacing it with private enterprise transport industry and they certainly are not going to have conductors. Mm. Well, it, it strikes me that uh, a lot of people are getting supplemental benefit and uh, unemployment benefit as like myself is at the moment when if the government could pump some of that money into the transport and take people off the roll and then there won't be, you know, you see lots of people around pressing at the moment just walking around in a day, not knowing what to do because they're unemployed, they can't get a job and basically nothing to do. Well, to be honest, Joe, there are far more productive and long-term value ways of the government spending money. They could do something about the infrastructure of our nation. They could actually repair the roads more quickly. They That's could true. build some of the roads we need. Yeah. They could... One job, one job that I think the nation would welcome eventually is if they paid someone to take all the transmission lines down and bury them. I realise it would cost yeah. billions of pounds. But it yeah. would be nice, wouldn't it, if we yeah, got rid piling, of those scars? Piling, knocking them out. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a thought, but then again, Alan, it's <laughs> we're just a small, a small cog in the big wheel. Well, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Okay, Alan. Ta-ra. 
I'll do Chris. Hi, Alan. You've uh, just been saying something about uh, Margaret Thatcher promising to do something about shortening the dough queues. Yeah. Yeah, well, she did do something. Go on. She asked them all to stand closer together. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble is. Also, also is. she's made a new plan to ensure that we don't all suddenly become poor when we reach 60. Go on. She's going to make sure we're all bloody poor by the time we reach 30. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. OK, bye. Cheers. <laughs> Broadbent and Boothroyd's amazing half-price sale is on this Saturday. Just for one day only, we've half-price goods in all departments at Broadbent and Boothroyd's of Southport this Saturday. Now that you've spent pounds on everyone else, why not treat yourself to a new TV high file video from Good Rides of Preston and Southport? We've been saving our best offers of the season for our unrepeatable sale, starting December the 27th for a limited period only. So whether it's good sounds you're after or a microwave, it must be good rights for a good deal at the right price. One Friargate Preston and Lord Street close to Debenhams, Southport. Next week, Lostock Hall Kitchen Studios are moving to Preston Town Centre. This weekend, we're clearing our showroom. Everything's got to go. We've perfect display kitchens from £345. There's a beautiful Seamatic kitchen for only £1,950, reduced from £6,800. There's a water damage kitchen, only £175. They've all got to go. Special sales days for the Lostock Hall clearance are this Friday, 10 till 6, Saturday, 10 till 4, and Sunday, 10 till 4. Everything must go. Blinking egg, Dev. Why don't you get a decent radio to match this flash car? Well, that one cost an arm and a leg, but it's never been much good. Ah, you need to contact West Orton Car Radio, mate. They've got superb systems by Blaupunkt and Panasonic, such as the Blaupunkt Miran, which will fit for under 100 quid, including the aerial and speakers. Hey, and they've got the Blaupunkt D-Stock range at less than half the normal price. None of this distortion like with one of them. Blaupunkt what? Blaupunkt. It's German, isn't it? I thought you were supposed to be brainy. Hey, you can also get electric windows, vehicle alarms and car phones fitted by West Horton Car Radio. So find the right station with West Horton Car Radio, Church Street, West Horton. Phone West Horton 814-229 before you crack up. I'll do David. All right. Too young. I'll do Carl. Hello, Alan. I want to talk about hanging. I think it is still happening in this country. I know for a fact that a hanging took place in Lancashire this week. Pheasants taste better that way. Thank you very much. How do Marvin? Hello, it's Marvin the Paranoid Android here. I've Android? Well, oh, they make liver salts. How do Jacqueline? Jacqueline appears to have left us. Some say we're better off without her. How do Roger? Hello. Hello. Oh, let's talk about this B Big Ben on News at 10. I've never met the chap. Well, you know the Big Ben, it strikes five times instead of ten times. Does it, Big Ad? Pardon? I said, does it? Yeah, I wonder why. Perhaps they can't count. Oh, is that why? Well, it may well be why. I really don't know. Do you not feel it would be more productive to address your question to independent television news? I don't know what you mean. Do you not think you should ask them rather than me? Uh, no. Have you had your nuts and raisins today? No. Do your knuckles touch the floor? Well, you sound like a monkey. How do Mike? Hiya. The other day I went to the cinema and it was quite crowded. I went to watch this film and it was night time, right? And the film had already started by the time I got there. So I asked one of the usher vets to show me to a seat because it was quite dark inside. Saturday afternoons on Red Rose means sport and music action from 2 until 6. This Saturday we bring you the games between Blackburn Rovers and Brighton, Blackpool and Swansea, Wigan and Brentford, Burnley versus Aldershot and Preston North End versus Halifax Town. 
Plus, in Rugby League, the John Player Special Trophy Final featuring Wigan against Hull Kingston Rovers at Leeds. And a full roundup of national and international sports news and events as they happen. So join me, Pete Reeves, for a great afternoon of sport and music action this Saturday at 2 o'clock. I'll do Edgar. Uh, hello, Alan. They were a bloke on the other night uh, from Burnley, and uh, he was going on about, what's it, that, that music, honky-tonk piano music, they call it, don't they? That's the stuff. And you, piggling, ping, ping, piggling, ping, 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 Yeah, well, I don't think it is, that, and I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that I'm a member of the Gladys Mills Appreciation Society here in Preston. Gladys Mills? Yeah, she's an old, uh, she's dead now, I'm You mean Mrs Mills? Mrs Mills, what? Mrs Mills, hello Gladys, well, how are you Gladys. doing? Yeah, well, in fact, she is here tonight, and she's live in the studio with the Ends and Goat squad, so take it oh, away. Oh, no! Yes. Well, oh, I see you. I'm sure you've brought a certain warmth to the cockles of the hearts of psychiatrists as they sit there thinking, by God, lad, that's job security. Right, we're managed, <laughs> Thank you very much, Edgar. Good night. Good night. Good night. I hope they don't turn up. To, the last time they turned up, they, they brought me, would you believe, a plaster cock, which is a bird that lays eggs, not one of those things that, well, it lays eggs as well, but they sort of look like tadpoles. They also, they also brought with them a guitar. Now, I'm going to VHS Video Club's Rufford Road in Crossens, Southport on Saturday, and if the Ends and Goats squad turn up with a piano, that'll be more than, um... <laughs> no, they wouldn't dare. How do... Mike? Uh, good old. There's a couple of, things, a couple of things I wanted to ask you first. Uh, the first, first thing's like, I wrote here a couple of days ago, you see, um, but the address, I never put the postbox 301 on it. Well, it'll get here eventually. I put St Paul Square in Preston. It'll get here, don't worry. All uh, right. Um, the second thing was, um, I've been listening to you for a couple of weeks now, like, but I'm hooked as well. I can't, I can't get to sleep while I'm at school. I don't get to bed till about two o'clock. Don't worry about it. Can you change your chimes around, please? Um, no. Oh, go ahead. No, but let's face it, the school's shut most days anyway at the moment, so you don't need to worry. Not as, you know. Is I'm, it not? Are you not on strike? I'm, I'm not run by priests. Priests? Oh, they don't go on strike, good grief. Oh, they <laughs> they're horrible, aren't they, priests? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, priests and nuns are very nice people, but when they're teachers, they're horrible. I know. I had a Sister Rita when I was a kid. Sister Rita used to run St. Benedict's Junior School, and she was horrible. She could do things with a jam spoon that should be illegal. <laughs> uh, I go to West Park in St. Helens, right? And one of the brothers has just run off, our RE teacher. He's run off with a nun. I don't think we want to know that. Honestly, he's no. just run off with a nun, and we've well, got no Well, there are some very pretty nuns. Honestly, we're doing our, our, our O-level RE now, and we've got no teacher, because the brothers are loped. <laughs> Good night, Mike. Thank <laughs> <laughs> I'll do, Linda. Hi, Alan. Hello. Um, I'm just ringing in reference to the lady who rang last night, the psychiatric nurse, and she made doctor's perceptionists sound very thick and stupid and irresponsible. Some of them are, Linda. Uh, well, well, some of them aren't. Uh, oh, indeed, I agree. Uh, but sh she made them all sound very... No, I don't think she did. I think that's possibly your paranoia acting. But everybody's, everybody makes mistakes, and you said that we should be dismissed just like that. I mean... I said not that hospital receptionists should be dismissed, if you listened carefully enough. Doctor's receptionists? No, no, sorry, doctor's receptionists. What I actually said was that doctors who permit their receptionists to write prescriptions should be struck off. That's what I said. That's very strong, isn't it? 
not quite strong enough, well, but it's as far as the law allows us to go. That, that's our job, I mean, I'm sorry, it is not your job. You may think it's your job. Your employer may well have taught you to think it is your job. But the issuing of prescriptions is a doctor's job. That is why it requires a doctor's signature. Hmm. Well, uh, with, with our doctor having 4,000 patients, he hasn't got time to see I care more. not what the excuse is, Linda. I really don't. Well, I do like appreciate the pressure of work on doctors. I do appreciate the pressure of work on the awful things that doctors' receptionists have to tolerate in the form of some of the patients who are, let's face it, an awful lot of them, yes. malingerers and bad-mannered. Yes. And you have to stand there and have their disgusting germs breathed all over you. I understand all of that. But the truth is, Linda, that no receptionist, no receptionist anywhere should be allowed to write a prescription, ever. Right. I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm not irresponsible or stupid. I've not made a mistake yet. Pretty but, Linda, well. the person alive who hasn't made a mistake and won't make a mistake is actually non-existent. You will make a mistake. That is inevitable. You are entitled to make a mistake. The problem, Linda, is that you are not supposed to be doing the job. It's rather like, only well, not... What's the point in having a doctor receptionist then? What, what for? That's rather like saying, why do we have a receptionist at Red Rose Radio? The receptionist is the receptionist. He or she is not the person that makes the radio programmes, does the news, mends the equipment when it breaks, or even sweeps the floor. She is the receptionist. End of story. Alice is our telephonist. Alice's job is to take the calls and pass them to me, for me to deal with. If Alice started having conversations with everybody, that would take something away from the program. Mm -hmm. Alice is well able, I'm sure she can do this damn program better than me. I don't know anyone that can't do this program better than me. But the fact remains that I'm here to do it, and Alice's job is to take the calls. Your doctor's job is to diagnose and prescribe for the patients. Yeah, we don't you, diagnose or prescribe, we just do repeats. And it's I know you just do repeats. The problem is that frequently, very frequently, and it happens in your surgery as well, I promise you, there are people getting repeat prescriptions for things like what, what in America are called narcotics. Yeah. Major drugs, tranquilizers usually. Yeah. How many times, how many times have you written 50 milligrams Valium TDS on a prescription? Thousands. You have, by doing that, contributed to that person's drug addiction. Now, it's not your fault. I Honestly, I'm not criticising you. But your doctor, because you provide him either with a prescription made out and he just signs it, or in the more usual way, he gives you a pad of prescriptions already signed... No, he doesn't do that. Well, OK, but th that's the two ways of doing it, isn't it? Mm -hmm, yeah. But I know when, when I receive letters that one of our secretaries might have typed up, I'll get ten letters, and I sign them. Yes. And to be honest, I don't read them. Don't read them, no. And I don't know anyone that does. And the doctor's the same with the prescriptions. He devolves that responsibility to you. Yeah. It is his responsibility. Now, when anything goes wrong, it's not you the gonna clap in irons. It's yeah. not you the gonna criticise. It's him. him yeah. The problem is that that repeat prescription may well a be unnecessary, b be harmful. I do appreciate that the doctors are inundated with work and mm. have not the time to deal with it. The answer to that is more doctors. Yeah. But you're bypassing somebody's chance of health. But this, this nurse was saying last night that we, we are responsible for half these um, psychiatric patients up at the hospitals. Well, I don't think that's very fair. I think that was an overstatement. Yeah. I agree that overprescription is responsible. But I've, as I've just said, I don't put that down to you. I put it down to doctors. And I don't blame them entirely. I blame yeah. the pressure of work put upon them yeah. by the demands made of them. Also, an another point, that with these blacklists and whitelists, you know, it's, it's also very difficult. I mean, now the doctor does have to write a lot that we cannot write. That's a new law that's obviously just been brought in. I, I know about the blacklist and whitelist, yeah. and that's the first thing I've heard about it, where I've been able to say, well, good, it's doing yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, it is. All right, Linda. Okay, thanks, Alan. I wish you luck. Keep right. up the uh, good work, bad work, I don't know, but keep right. it up anyway. Thank you. <laughs>